Is Romans going to take it easy on us? That's what we're going to find out today in Romans 1. Well, the answer to that is no. My quick finding in all of this is that Romans is very deep and it's going to be a lot of discussions about what Paul was meaning about. I mean, this is the whole core of the church. But first, I wanted to do a quick reflection about the life of Paul. It confused me a bit because I was trying to place Romans in the timeline of what we heard in Acts. So I wanted to talk briefly about kind of his life and the timetable with it. So first of all, Paul was born in around 5, 6 AD in Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen. And Judea in 7 AD became a Roman province. Somewhere in 14 AD, Augustus gets poisoned and Tiberius comes to power. That's going to be his son. Paul was in school working with Gamaliel in Jerusalem. That's around somewhere between 15 and 20 AD. And he became a Pharisee somewhere in 30 AD. Stephen's stoning was somewhere around 32. So he's a brand new Pharisee. And his persecution of the church then started thereafter. They think, obviously, these are estimated dates, but that his conversion on the road to Damascus was somewhere around 34. Then he travels to Arabia and remains there for some period of time. Then somewhere around 37, he goes to back to Jerusalem, goes back to Tarsus because, again, he was causing the hubbub. We learned about that in Acts. But there's a number of years that we gap in this whole process. That is when around 46 AD, somewhere there, Barnabas goes and travels to Tarsus to seek Paul. I mean, that was nearly nine years. So nine years, that's when that happened. Then he goes on his trip to Antioch with Barnabas. That's when they had the prophecy of the famine. That's when they sent aid back to Jerusalem. Barnabas then went to Saul and John Mark was with them. And then they separated because of this battle that John Mark left. Then all the trips that we've been hearing about, 48 AD, all the things that we heard where he got stoned, where he did these travels to these towns, that's all in about 48, goes back to Jerusalem around 49, travels then again more after that. Then in 51, is when Paul and Silas were in prison because they casted out the demons and then they were released. He goes to Ephesus somewhere around 53 AD and then goes back on his trips back through that whole area and ended up in Caesarea. Then he went to Jerusalem. He gets arrested somewhere around 57 AD. And then that's where the whole part where he was kept in house prison The Romans were protecting him. Somewhere in 59 AD, he arrives in Rome somewhere around 60. Remember, we had that winter. He's trapped in the shipwrecks. And then he's released from prison. He does more missionary work. He's imprisoned again under Nero at 66 AD. Somewhere thereafter is martyred. One of the things that happens at that point is in 68 AD, Nero commits suicide. Then Vespian takes place after a big civil war. And then in 70 AD, not too long after, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. The people are removed by Titus. And that's when that vision that Jesus had goes into effect. I I don't know about you, but like I said, I was a little bit confused about this timeline. And so these books, these letters, was written when he traveled back to Greece and Macedonia somewhere around 56 AD. So there were letters to the Corinthians, Thessalonica, the Galatians. Those letters were earlier in his ministry. So just so you have a little bit idea. So basically, this letter is written in 56, and he actually does get a chance to go to Rome and meet the Roman church in 60. So it was four years later. But I just wanted to give you that kind of framework. One of the things about Romans is that he reasons out the theology of the Christian church. He goes through the whole idea of justification of how our sin is paid for and who if anybody, which the answer is nobody, can feel justified on their own. The gospel saves everybody, no matter who you are. The interesting thing, too, about this congregation in Rome is that, as far as we know, none of the apostles, including Paul, started this church. So we're starting to see people like Apollos. Remember, we heard about Apollos who learned about this, not from any of the apostles that we had. People are hearing and teaching other people about it. I mean, this is really the distinction of a faith. When you're a sacking army and you come through and you force people 
at sword point to become your faith. Again, you don't have people like Paul and Barnabas visiting you to make sure you're doing all right, educating you, try to help you understand the faith better. But the other thing is true is that those people don't go out and tell other people because they were brought to a faith under the sword thing, you know, like Babylonians, right? You, you're not going out and preaching the gospel of the Babylonians because this is people believing and their heart is changing and it's turning towards God and they feel compelled to go tell other people. In fact, Jesus told us to go tell other people. So this congregation didn't probably start with any of them. And in fact, it could have been, you know, some people say someone who saw Paul's other witnessing or maybe someone who was in Jerusalem, either for one of the holidays, maybe witnessed what happened to Jesus. But then some of the worships after that point saw some of these events, then went back home to Rome. If you're Jewish, you're still trying to make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem every year if you can make it. In Catholicism, they also believe that Peter was the pope or the bishop of Rome at an earlier time. So there's no evidence of that as far as I understand. I mean, obviously, there's going to be church tradition. And of course, church tradition is written closer to time of when these things happened. But we don't have, like I said, any sort of documentation that Peter was actually there. So let's go ahead and start off with Romans 1. And he starts off with a greeting. And he says he's a servant of Christ, a called apostle. So he calls himself apostle. And he set himself apart for preaching this gospel. Like I said, it's amazing, isn't it? That he went and had this event happen to him on Damascus. Meanwhile, the apostles, the other apostles, are traveling with Jesus for three and a half years, learning at his footsteps, understanding what was going on, and then witnessed the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. Some people suggest that Paul was at that crucifixion, but it obviously didn't change him at that point because that's where he went on his tear to persecute the church. But he learned so much. Now I'm all in. I am doing this. I am working to bring this faith to other people. And he is called as a servant of Christ. And people were talking about this word servant, bringing a special point to his very first sentence, Paul, a servant of Christ. This word is the word that you would say a bond servant. And so we mentioned before that slavery and indebted servitude, it was not what we think of as slavery in this particular case. If you had debts, or maybe like I said, you wanted to buy a plot of land, you would go into a service probably, I think, for seven years. And then at the end of the seven years, your debts are supposed to be forgiven. So debts were only seven years long worth of time. But if you decided you wanted to stay with the person who you were in bondship with, who, who you were bond servant to, you like them, you like the work, you want to stay there and just be a part of the household voluntarily, put like a spike through your ear and declare you as part of this, I don't want to say family, but you are now decided that you are going to stay there. That's the kind of word that was used here as a servant. He has decided to become a slave or a servant to Jesus. So it's a big word. So this greeting is really interesting. He talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and obedient in faith. He gives the, the greeting that a lot of churches will use, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. My church does that every week. So this is a big deal. It's a standard form that Paul uses for all his letters where he starts off saying who he is, giving why I'm writing this or who I am and, and giving you this message. Now, when we write letters or emails, we put our name at the end. Love, Jill. He is writing this to those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. At this point, hasn't been to Rome. So we know now that he really wanted to go to Rome. And so when he demanded a seat in front of Caesar to plead his case, that was his goal. He wanted to go to Rome. And he wants to go for good reasons, because he wants to impart some spiritual gifts to them, but he wants to also be encouraged by their faith as well. He is aware of how strong of a church this is. And so it's a mutual benefit to them all. He is going there not as a father, you know, father figure, but also as a brother in Christ. And he says that he also thinks that there should be some other Gentiles that he could reap the harvest. Jesus talked about reaping the harvest and that he's under obligation. This is interesting. He says to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, 
the barbarians are going to be the people outside of that area. So we started seeing Germanic tribes that were the origin of the Celtic and Pict people that we see in England, we see in France with the Franks. There are many tribes that came out of this particular group of barbarians. And some of them were very early in becoming Christians in the church. But he feels obligated, no matter who you are, to preach the gospel. He says he's not ashamed of the gospels, that he wants that power of salvation for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. First to the Jews and then to the Greeks. You know, and not just the Greeks, but everybody. Because that righteousness is revealed from faith for faith. And that's the same message that we heard Jesus say, too, that at first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, but not just the Greeks. And that word that he wants to bring to people, and why he's saying that he's not ashamed, is that he's being bold. He's not one of those people who, I, I worked at a company once where someone outright said something pretty horrible about Christians and the Christian faith. And do you sit there and you take it, or do you say something about it? and stand up for your faith. And he's saying, I'm not ashamed, meaning I am standing up full blast and I am saying the thing. He's not embarrassed. He's not couching what he believes. And he talks about the power of God's salvation. And the word power is dynamis, which is the word we get dynamite from. It's explosive. It is powerful to you know blow things apart, I think. But anyway, it is a very big word. So he's talking about how this salvation it is for everybody and how it comes to everybody. He gets right into the core of the Christian faith is because God's wrath was set out against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness. We saw that in the time of Noah, that we are not supposed to be ungodly, that we are supposed to follow God's plan and God's truth. And I always think of it, and I've said it before, that God created us. He wrote the owner's manual to us. He knows how we're supposed to live. And when we live outside of that plan, it's like we're a car saying, I don't want an oil change. And we should be living in a way that honors God because he knows how our heart was supposed to go. This whole truth of God has been made plain, stone. It says invisible attributes of the, the divine nature And he says that throughout the creation of the world, you are able to see this. So if people who didn't even know God did not honor him or give him thanks and their hearts were darkened or people who claim to be wise and instead you're sitting there and worshiping man-made objects or animals or creeping things, but you're worshiping the wrong thing. No matter whether you know God, you don't know God, you're all messing it up, but it is something that you can see clearly in the creation of the world. It is made obvious, and you are worshiping creations, not the creator. And they gave themselves up to impurities and talks about sexual impurities. He says, quote, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve a creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. All these things that we're doing, you're going against God and whether you're envious and murdering, sexual impurities, gossiping, slander. I mean, he lists all of these. Being disobedient to parents, inventors of evil, foolish, faithless hearts. I mean, we know all these things. And it says that God's righteousness decrees that we deserve to die, that we don't do the practices that were given to us by God. So he is just laying it all out there. These are all the things that we are doing wrong and we should come back to God, that we should be restored to God, but instead we don't, and then we deserve death for all of this. What I think he's doing is he's pointing out the importance of what Jesus did for our sins, that he paid for those, that he said, I will take the burden on for all these sins. I will take the punishment on. You know, you always see that, right, in those classic action movies where The hero of the movie says, let them go and you can have me. That's what Jesus did right off the bat. And he's saying about why this is important. It's so easy for us, I think, in our society to think sin is not important. That's just, you know, I just stole a pencil or I just stole five bucks, you know, because I needed five bucks. Or I just 
lied or I did this and I did that. And we get into this way where we just sort of justify sin because, well, you know, I had reasons. And he is saying that because of all these things that you're doing, it deserves death. In his words himself, he asked a question, who made all of this bad thing happen? And, and the answer is us. We made, we've done this to ourselves. That we exchange the glory of God, we exchange the good things of God, the way that God wrote our owner's manual and told us to be, and instead we just exchange it because we like our evil lifestyle. We like worshiping the things that were made instead of God himself. And even people who claim to be wise are not wise at all. The bigger point of this is that it's not even that he's mad because some people don't even know the gospel or doesn't know enough information, that they didn't hear the gospel, they didn't see everything that they were supposed to see, and they didn't have the knowledge. It's not ignorance or lack of knowledge that's causing them to do these bad things, because it's all apparent in the world, apparent from the time of creation. Instead, it is because we pick to do wicked things. We pick to be disobedient. It's not about knowledge. You know, you always think that, right? Like, if I just understood, and I've done, I've done this with diets, if I knew a little bit about dieting, I could lose all the weight. No, it's, it's, it's because you're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. You don't need another book. You don't need some more knowledge. And we sometimes do that or think, well, I'm in my 20s. I'm having fun. I'm having a good time. You know, in my 30s, I'm going to be boring. I can follow God then. We choose to be wicked or we choose to go against God's word. He says, you know, it's been laid out that the divine plan, this internal power is clearly understood. When you look at the creation, you understand a great God made everything. And so it's written, he says, you know, inside our hearts, we can understand it. We can see it. Whether we heard about Jesus, we heard about God, we can look at the sunrise and see that just didn't happen. Obviously, it's the big example they always talk about, which is the watchmaker discussion on a hiking path. And you found a watch. You think, well, who made this? Right? You don't think, wow, how did these springs jump together to create a watch? That was always the thing that Noam Chomsky said. If you gave, you know, 300 monkeys typewriters, eventually they would type Shakespeare. No, they really wouldn't. And nor would the earth assemble itself, right? that this is apparent when we look at this creation and we look at the sunrise and the sunset and the caterpillars turning into butterflies, all of this is apparent that there is a God who wrote the code to life and the systems to life and put all of this together. And that is deep. So what I'm going to meditate on is the fact that this world and God's attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, he says, is apparent in this world. And I'm going to think about how many things I see on a day-to-day basis that just makes it clear this world is not only created, the systems created, but is run by God. And he made everything. And not only that, he wrote the owner's manual to the universe, to us, and we should listen to that. What I'm going to pray about is that I don't use my own imaginings, my own desires, to take me away from what God's plan is, what God wants for me, the way that God wants me to live. I'm always going to think about that. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that this is apparent, that God's signature is everywhere in this world, and it is apparent to everybody. And what he is asking us to do is to live in the way he has asked us to live, because he wrote the owner's manual. He told us how this world should be. That's why I think, too, that you'll find many cultures all throughout the world where people do find murder wrong, stealing wrong. All the things that we find wrong, it is apparent and written in our hearts to do outside of those things is actually the unnatural way to live. Because if we saw God's word, we would understand the nature of the the joy that God has called us to do by living in the way he has asked us to live without sin. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Romans is going to be a tough nut to crack. I can see already. But please remember to subscribe and tell a friend. 
and let everyone know that you're listening to this podcast and please follow along and listen to it chapter by chapter. I always find it kind of interesting because I get download figures and every once in a while I'll see something like Acts 23 gets a lot of downloads, but Acts 24 doesn't. And I thought, does someone have anything against that particular chapter because it got less downloads? I don't know how it works. But doing this every day, going through this, and hopefully you reading the Bible on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays in between chapters so we can keep up and do this together, I think that's where you'll get your best experience. So thanks so much for listening. <laughs>